Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Calix and Crew podcast. Before we get started, don't forget to follow us on Patreon over at Doc Calix. We've got plenty of entertainment, game shows, giveaways, and all kinds of good stuff. You also get to meet with these breeders, question them, whoever we have as guests on our podcast. We try to invite over to our Discord so you can go ask them one-on-one questions if you want to, and you get tons of other goodies. It's just a great experience overall. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to Stoner Days Apparel. You guys can go over to shop.stonerdays.com, use code CALYX, that's all caps, C-A-L-Y-X, at checkout to get a whopping 20% off your order. Now, I'm very excited about today's episode. We have Sunleaf on the other line. He's going to be talking about some of the methods that he uses to repopulate land races. He's going to talk about that Sinai that I grew, that beautiful Egyptian land race. Um, we're going to talk about replicating environments with some of these land races, as well as Sunleaf's intuition of getting into growing, what got him into breeding, and where he sees Sunleaf Seed Company going in the future. We appreciate having him on. We got him on the other line right now, so let's just jump into the episode. Sunleaf, how you doing, my brother? Doing well. Thanks Good. for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. So, before we really get deep into things, I wanted to reiterate for people that may not be acquainted with Sunleaf Seed Company, who are you? Where are you from? What are you all about? Well, we're based out of Colorado primarily right now. We've done a lot of multi-state work um, over the past few years. But um, what we're all about is breeding seeds for everybody, basically. Um, We want to encompass the market, being able to have uh, high CBD, THC seeds, uh, strains that will be good for people who aren't, you know, some of these new states coming up, you don't have people who are wanting to smoke 30% THC strains. So we have some stuff that, you know, you would consider, would be considered mid as far as the market would go, as far as THC testing. But um, people still really like it. We also have those really great high testing THC strains and um, land race strains, which we really, uh, those ones we really hold dear because uh, of preservation, you know, as the legalization worldwide becomes more prevalent, um, these kind of old strains that have been the the backbone to all of our creations uh, can get lost uh, with all the pollen contamination and uh, huge hemp fields actually that have been authorized to grow in our our whole country and other countries as well. Um, has really been one of those uh, rushes to people to preserving the uh, heirloom. So that is um, a lot of what we do is preservation, uh, preservation breeding, and um, breeding hybrids that mainly like breeding hybrids I like to smoke, you know, and in turn, uh, a lot of other people like to smoke too. So, um, that's kind of where we're at with our breeding. I like to make something that, like, you know, I don't want to, other than auto flower, we haven't really dove into that too much yet. Right. So, well, that's, you know, I appreciate you mentioning that because a lot of people um, don't mention that. We talk about land races a lot on my show. We talk about land races a lot on the live shows as well. But one of the things that doesn't get brought up very often is why it's important to preserve these genetics, that they are going away, that there is climate and environmental factors that are eroding and taking away some of these populations. So, yeah, the respect. potential for them to be watered down, you know, or get cross pollinated. And, you know, these farmers aren't some, these farmers don't have a lot of money in some of these uh, areas. And, uh, you know, they're, they're making seeds for their next season consistently. So um, pollination contaminated uh, crop, you know, it could be a devastating thing. And it forever change the um, variety. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's something that we feel important. But also, it's really great for people to play with, too. It's, it's really interesting. But that's not all what you do. You don't strictly do preservation efforts, right? No. No, I that... do like to make um, poly hybrids and modern modern style hybrids, you know. Uh, and what's your and goal with that? High THC um, and the effect. 
you know, obviously the, we're breeding for, you know, when you're breeding for production, which is what I would consider like modern day flowers, you know, most people want some of skin fields. So, you know, these are all secondhand things I consider, you know, like, of course I want to breed for yield and quality. So it's, it's kind of given that when we're working these modern lines, like this is the, the goals we're trying to achieve is, you know, um, high THC, a uh, bag of peel, uh, yield, um, all, you know, these are all things that benefit the farmer. So that's another thing, you know, that comes second hand is like, we're, we're all about the farmer, you know, the growers and, um, really trying to elevate strains to the point where, you know, if you've ever grown some of these varieties that have been hyped up, you, you see like, oh yeah, it's really great, but it doesn't yield very much. You know, you wouldn't do a whole garden of it, you know? So, um, these are the kind of things we're trying to do with our breeding to kind of bring up, bring lines up to production lines. So not only are you preserving some of these land races, but you're trying to work them into modern hybrids so people get what they want out of, you know, what they see, one of the more modern cultivars, but incorporating the medicinal benefits of those land races into that. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, there is a between you know i we work quite a few projects and i do have lots of um f1 hybrids i would i would call them like very similar to two f1 where you're taking two inbred lines and um breeding them together and that process is very uniform but what you'll find with our direct land race hybrids um they're very very uniform just like an f1 would be and these ones you're going to find the most medicinal properties you will find the some lean towards the land race, some lean towards the modern cultivar, because typically I like to cross them to a modern cultivar. And that really kind of helps out that modern cultivar gene pool. And what you can do is work that line and go through and select through inbreeding towards, you know, whatever you're looking for. But it's very medicinal. Like these, these strains that we're working that are land race hybrids, they're very medicinal properties. They don't have very high THC, most of them, but they're really great. They have, they're really great for breeding. They will take um, qualities that you don't see in the modern cultivars, like pest resistance and mildew and mold resistance, you know, and really be able to bump that up. Absolutely. So um, it, it, it leaves, it's, it's like a stepping stone a lot of some of the work we're doing is creating stepping stones that you, you know, cutting out some of the, the work that you don't have to do, but so you can, you know, pick up where we, where we started it. Mm-hmm. And that's another one of our goals is, you know, get people into breeding their own seeds and uh, using tools like uh, land race genetics to be able to, you know, help them breed stuff that isn't going to, um, that is going to be successful for them, you know, for whatever their goal is, you know, making an auto flower or, you know, maybe making something more medicinal, you know. Absolutely. That kind of stuff. That's awesome. We do have a couple different styles of breeding. That we do. You know, we do the strictly land race breeding where we're preserving land race. We do the land race hybridization where we're using more modern cultivars with the land race. And then I'm doing the, the normal style breeding that you see most of these days where we're doing uh, polyhybrids to polyhybrids, modern cultivars to modern cultivars. Some of these some of these lines I've worked quite extensively and then I'll cross them to the modern cultivars and you you'll see in some of our seeds that it really brings up the um, yields and size of the trichomes. So um, it it's really like a a, a guided work on some of these lines to be able to do that that's awesome man we really respect you for doing that too um what are you know one of the things i like to ask all my guests especially my guests that are breeders is out of all the work that you've ever done what types have you made that you say represent your work the best um you know uh actually um I would have to say there's some of the stuff that I don't consistently grow, but it would be the land race hybrid. Um, just because it's 
seems like people get so much joy out of throwing them. Um, and it makes me feel good that I made them, you know, to make other people happy. But just the fact that um, they're so unique. And you don't see a lot of people doing that um, these days. And, yeah. Out of, out of those I, land race hybrids, which one of them would you say is your favorite? Um, well, they're <laughs> all unique in their own way, to be honest. Like, you know, each one has its own different quality. And that's what's so special about these plants. Yeah. Um, you know, you go, the Lebanese is going to be so CBD rich. Um, it's got very, I wouldn't say very low, but moderately low THC. And even in some of the phenotypes that you can find, um, these are really great medicinal plants. And then you go over just a little bit to the Egyptian, and all of a sudden, you know, there's no CH, or there's no CBD nearly, and it's, it's much higher THC, and it's all bred for a fact. You know, I got to tell you, that it, makes me really, really happy because that Sanai just got done curing up and we were going to smoke some of it for the first time this Sunday. Oh, yeah. You should do it while I'm on, I'm on the phone. I, I'm, I'm so, you know what? We can do that. We can arrange that. <laughs> um, it is really interesting. I, I don't want to say what the effect, I mean, I don't know if I've talked to you the last, last time about the effect or you might have. You haven't, really. Oh, the main okay, cool. the main well, reason well, I was changing or chasing that uh Sanai was for that granule terpene. Um I was looking through different right. cultivars that were high in the granule and Sanai popped up and then I saw that you had it and I was like, Well, hell, we're gonna hunt these. Yeah, and did you get any terpene te uh tested? I did not get them tested. I test with my nose because I am a home hobby road. <laughs> no yeah, no but you know, I can say um, they all had a very, very granule smell to them. They had heavy, heavy floral rose scents. Yeah, um, it, it was exactly fairly in, inbred. Most of them, some of them had like a musky, skunky spiciness to them, but they they all seemed to carry that floral scent. There was one that really, really stuck out to me, and I did a small pollination on that one, and it definitely carried what I would say was a peach essence. And that's why I was stoked to not only keep those yeah. seeds around and go through them, but go through those uh, peach rec crosses that you sent me with the Sinai. Oh, yeah, you're going to like those. Um, speaking on those pe peach rec real quick, those are probably the peachiest herb, you know, uh, of the market right now. If you, anybody goes out and grabs, like, any of the peach stuff, or if you're into peaches, like, if you can find my peach cobbler or um, the violet peach, I, I don't want to say I have one more somewhere but um it's probably the most unique peach turf i've ever worked with it's like nothing else it's all coming off of that peach rack that's and, awesome uh, it's really great and the cyanide that's exactly how i would describe the terpene if you were to ask me what it, it smelled like a musky rose or like floral and then some i've had people say mango you you found one that said uh what did you say it was peach um, so I could totally see that. I've actually seen in some of the hybrids that I've made with it, um, those terpenes come out even more. It's definitely with reminiscent with of stone fruit. I, we can we can sum it up to that, like the apricot, mango, peach, like yeah, stone fruit, yeah. you know? Yeah, totally apricot, just like that, yeah. And so what I was speaking on that is like how unique they are. You go from one location to the next, you know, it's totally different. You know, the, the Pakistani that I have is um, very, like, I want to say burning tires and earthy, burning tires, patchy, um, very much for, like, THC development, you know, it's, like, for getting stone. Um, and so all of these are, like, different tools that people can use and access. And that was one of the reasons that we put our seeds our land race pack um, has 24 packs, 24 seeds per pack, so you get enough to play with. Because you'll find some, you might find some auto flowers in there, and that that can that diverges into the way that we do the breeding. You know, um, I'm not doing any sort of inbreeding with these, where we're selecting one male and one female. Uh, I'm leaving the population 
uh, very open so that you you can see what the what they were working with um, over you know in the field and um, you'll have all that genetic uh, information to be able to like pull from you know what I mean mm-hmm. where you'll find some that might have an auto flower trait you'll find some that might be stretchier might be more vigorous or less leafy leaf to calyx ratio you know so we we tried to leave everything in there so you know obviously we pulled anything out that had undesirable traits like from aphrodisiac but you can only do so much you know when we're right. talking about growing something and this is another thing that i've noticed is we're talking about something that grows where they're putting very little input into the ground um and you take it and you give it everything it needs or everything we think it and it's way too much for it so yeah um it is one of those things where uh you do have to tread lightly you can't treat it like a modern cultivar and pound a bunch of food into it but i have seen people do it <laughs> so you know we are trying to remove problematic genotypes and phenotypes you know when they arise but you know we can only do so much so it, you do have to you know, take these with like I would say like with a grain of salt kind of where you don't definitely don't need to use as much food and input as you would. Right. Normally. Well that's one of the things about replicating the environments of these heirlooms is you're trying to replicate in a way their environment because you can't treat them like modern polyhybrids, right? Right. Some of them like it a little yeah. bit drier. Some of them like it a little bit wetter. Some of them don't like any nutrition. They're used to growing up in sandy soil, while others are used to growing in very, very nutrient-rich. Yeah, and I've seen this. You know, you can take some of these and grow them um, in different environments. I've seen people take the Pakistani and grow it in um, Hawaii and do actually do inbreeding projects with it where they've been selecting the male and female that do the best for four seasons. And and now everything that comes out of that uh, is, is really great. It's climatized. It's still Pakistani, but uh, it's in Hawaii. So it's really interesting. There's lots of work that people can do. It's, you know, the main thing is that we were just trying to make access for it. We're, we're not, I'm not trying to lay claim to any of these um, heirlooms or land races. Uh, I just wanted to give people access in North America. That was our original idea was that let's give access, let's order a bunch from overseas, let's get them from private collectors, let's do repopulation of, that, of, of moderate size, you know, 25 plus males and females, and um, make them available, available in North America because one of the worst things, and you know, uh, biggest decision seed buying is that having to order from overseas is always a drag. You might lose your, you know, your order to customs. So that was the whole thing is we wanted to eliminate that, that whole barrier. That whole and process. Give, yeah. Give Americans and people in North America, um, access to, uh, land races without having to order from overseas and wait two or three weeks to get them. You know, that that was the whole idea of that. You know, it was just the access, genetic access. For, yeah, we uh, appreciate it and we product. respect that because I can tell you firsthand that I've had you know plenty of packages that have been intercepted and you know and then right. you don't get your seeds and fuck there goes your money. Yeah, yeah, and you know, some, and that's the other thing too is where uh, you have ordered from overseas and sometimes those seed banks will will give you a, a refund or they'll resend them, but they might not be the same seeds. So you yep. know, it's always a risk. It's always a risk. And that was one of the things that we, we wanted to give people access, and we thought that was really important, genetic information. Would you that say was that here. was a big push of what got you into breeding? No. No? What was it that got you into breeding no. first? What got me into breeding was um, just that there was nothing that, there wasn't a lot of stuff in North America at the time that we were, you know, growing. And um, uh, what you could find was very limited, and it wasn't always very good. And when 
we did order from overseas, you know, it's always a risk, like we were just saying. So the reason that we started breeding was because there was just uh, not very good access to stuff. So our idea was to just start breeding on our own for us. And that's what we did for several years, actually. So, um, you know, we started growing. I started growing in 2008. Uh, we didn't start breeding um, until 2011. I actually was working with a partner. Um, I met him in about 2010. We started breeding. We were growing together. We started breeding in 2011. And um, the reason we started breeding was just to make our own seed because we were just dissatisfied with everything we were getting. So that was kind of the push. The idea to start preserving stuff came later, you know, after we had decided, like, let's incorporate some, let's, let's, put, let's like, incorporate some land races into our stuff. Let's, let's incorporate some stability back into these lines. So that's when we started to order stuff, you know, from overseas, Middle East, you know, collectors from India, uh, wherever we can find collectors who were, you know, able to travel at that at the time. It, it's hard to think back, you know, if people were able to travel after we've been cooped up for a whole year, but um, we would get them from collectors from different areas or uh, seed banks, gene banks from different areas Great. in Europe. So before all of this, you were still in Colorado when you began growing for the first time? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So you're a it lifetime. Was, um, yeah. Yeah. I um Oregon is another state that we associate with pretty um heavily. Um and um actually you'll you're gonna see us pop up there a lot more in twenty twenty one. Um but um I do have growing experience in southern Oregon where we're growing outside in two hundred gallon pots and you know. The climate there is very different. People think of Oregon as being like rainy and humid all the time. Where we're at in southern Oregon, it's dry. Yeah, it's, it's a different like world. Hundred degrees. Oh, it's crazy. It, it's so, like um, eastern and western Washington. Yeah, yeah. I've never been. I've never really been to Washington other than Seattle. So um, I have no idea. Direct but. opposite of Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Sagebrush and cactuses. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, we've I've got a few, you know, like experience growing in a few um, regions. Um, obviously, you know, when you're inside, you can control your climate uh, much easier. Uh, but even even depending on where you're at, you know, you're going to be different. There's going to be different pressures that you have when you're setting up a new environment. So, you know, just um, yeah, we've got multi-state experience but um and, and you know it's continually expanding as we uh as the uh, legalization is going very awesome very awesome what would you say is the number one strain that you sell out of the fastest the number one you know um i wouldn't i wouldn't say i have a number one strain that sells out the fastest but i do have some stuff that that seems to really hit it, it it all seems to be whatever the flavor is that year you know um banana seems to be really popular right now we got a lot of people picking up the raspberry banana you know an all-time favorite uh typically um that everybody unanimously seems to like is coffee um so we did a little bit of work with Kaya's coffee um I would just say it really depends on whatever is popular because I've made some grape strains about four years ago and, you know, I put them on the menu and uh, they're really great strains. You know, they weren't popular two years ago, but for some reason people are scooping them up really quick this year. Nice. So it just seems like whatever flavor people are into. Because, you know, I'm trying to breed, you know, not just what I like, you know, I'll throw some, some stuff in there that I don't necessarily like to smoke, you know, just because a lot of the other people like to smoke, you know, someone like Tropicana, which is a, a surfing that I'm not a, super fond of, like jelly bean, tangy, yeah, and, I'm with uh, you. tangerine flavor. Um, 
I'm not really fond of it, but it's really, really popular for other people. So absolutely, you know, I make seed for people, so I gotta make what they like. So one of the strains that really brought Sunleaf Seed Company to my attention that I heard a ton of people raving about was the unleaded. Yeah. What's, what's that all about? The unleaded is great. It's an ice cream cake crossed with our black top. And the black top is the sour diesel Nigerian bread. Ooh, that's why. And so, <laughs> yeah, and that is really the, yeah, the black top is really great. The black top is actually a strain that I acquired from other breeders in Oregon who, um, they, we traded it. Um, and, yeah, the funny story on the black top really quick is actually I went to one of these um, home growers up in Oregon. Uh, dispensaries were there. Uh, home growers were there. Everybody was there uh, handing out flowers to each other, trying to flower. Um, basically, like this was somebody gave me a couple buds of this and it had 10 seeds, 15 seeds in it. And um, it was the best flower that I smoked, like out of wow. everything. And it was black and red. Ooh. And the guy, the guy was like, "Oh, we're calling it. We call it black top." And because uh, it's like asphalt, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it had been bred for several seasons, with the selection being for sour flavor, with the Nigerian buzz. Nice. And, That's beautiful. And a very cool head effect, like um, headband. Um, and so. We grew it out, and we continued to work with it, and everything that it touches seems to bump up the resin head size, bump up the yield from top to bottom. Uh, it adds a sour flavor, and it'll add that uplifting sativa buzz to it. So it kind of overpowers the stuff, but it leaves, it leaves really good trace of the mom. So, um, and like... Like I said, it bumps up the yield. So when we crossed that to the ice cream cake, it was just putting out stuff that was like Coke bottles. And um, I handed out a few of them to a few people, and some people got some good pictures of them. But uh, that's the main thing is like that's going around. I think that's going to be a big one once some more people get to see it. Uh, Build the soil doing a whole two by two tent with one plant in it and I wish him all the luck but I hope it doesn't stretch too much because that it, it that thing is going to yield a lot I really you know he, he actually messaged me and told me it yielded more than anything he's ever grown awesome yep. we're going to take a quick yeah. break we'll be right back with Sunleaf Seed Company Alright, we are back with Sunleaf Seed Company. Before we left, we were talking about some of his methods with repopulating these land races, some of the cultivars that he works with. Not only is he doing preservation efforts, but he's working on true hybrids, and he's working on polyhybrids as well. He's also doing a lot of fem work now, and we're going to jump into that. We're going to be talking about how he feminizes seeds, what he's been working on, what's to come with Sunleaf Seed Company. But first, we went through... And we dug out our peach pheno of the cyanide. I've been saying that wrong forever. Cyanide. 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 I need to nail that in my head. But we found the peach pheno. I've got some loaded up, and we're going to do a live review. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. I hope it's good. Right. So, all right. Well, I'll talk about the effect real quick. You're going to go through a portal. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, the effect is very similar from what I've reviewed wow. um, to uh, similar to like headbands almost, where you'll feel it kind of in your forehead, almost like your third eye. Really, really, really weird. That um, is wonderful. Say that. that is wonderful. You know, the, the flavor isn't overwhelming, 
but it's not it's not watered down it's not not there it's just a very very it, it's not an offensive one so it doesn't stick out you know but it's very very yeah, clean very even and it it just it's just a fresh clean flavor really yeah the, you know and that's one of the things like some of us younger people um that's nice before, that's beautiful before the major prohibition you know um we're so spoiled you know uh wow you can smoke some of these land races to where they you know they kind of taste like grass and uh it's always disappointing to grow it for eight or nine weeks and then i love it however long you know so yeah that that one is really that's a really good one i try and work with ones that are going to be that you're going to want to work with you know yeah Um, you can tell it's something that's not going to knock you out but yeah flavor we'll see effect in a little bit but flavor right off the bat clean burn beautiful smooth i would say that floral really came through and that's kind of what's leaning into that clean taste is kind of that floral yeah. essence to it and but that's one that'll it's light and it's stay nice on your palate too where uh, you can taste it after a couple minutes so. yeah yeah it's not getting super hashy it's not overloaded with resin to be no, able to like get too hashy herb. yeah yeah, that's a good one. It, it makes very nice. really great hybrids, actually. Uh, so I'm excited that you made some hybrids with it. I actually, I did the open pollination of the phenotypes that I like the most. And, you know, what yeah. I was seeing in that cyanide population, it is very inbred. There's not a lot of variation. But there was some that were taller with longer internodal spacing, and then there was some that were really, like you said, it was a pretty rare phenotype but there was some more uh broadleaf dominant plants that stayed shorter in structure and there was right. one oh. select female that peach one that was that broadleaf dominant which is what i was going after at first it expressed very very dark colors um even the male expressed really dark colors in his sacks but that female especially amongst the land race population it was frosty as hell and not only that but it was putting off that peach flavor and i was just like you're you're the one like it's just that obvious you know um so i hit the male with her and i kept a couple other females and hit them as well but i mainly wanted to select from that one plant and see what we can get out of that and then i was going to take those um probably make another selection and then outcross from there but last time i talked to you you said it actually took a couple outcrossings before you started reaching what's considered a more modernly acceptable uh, plant structure. Yeah, it, um, you probably experienced that some of these land rays, um flower density isn't going to be the same as we're used to with the modern cultivar, and so you might find that you do need to take it a few generations with a modern cultivar, or using very aggressive selection or dense flowers if that's what you're looking for. But um, that's the least of my concern. (laughs) Sure. And some people aren't concerned about that. The main thing I think that this is greatly used for is um, the terpene. The terpene flavor. That was the goal um, right off the bat. Yeah, I actually crossed it to um, some Afghani work that I did with one of my aliens. So it's called the Afghalian. I crossed it to my Afghalian, and it puts off massive nuts, like two-liter bottles almost. But they take like 13 weeks to finish, and um, it it's unbelievable how big you get. Uh, you wouldn't know, and this is like one of these recessive traits where it's like you don't see these these kind of phenotypes and genotypes within either one of those populations until we outcross. So. Um, it is a really great strain to be working with. Um, I'm happy that you're messing with it. I can tell you already, I'm already feeling the effects of it, which is actually <laughs> a little surprising. <laughs> but I'm yeah. Well, you know, it is. It is a so it is selected as a drug cultivar. That's what you would. That's what it would be considered over there, like in the Middle East, uh, uh, as a drug cultivar. And um, some of the tests actually are over. You know, six. Wow. Uh, and those tests were actually done in Oregon. Uh, wow. 
in southern Oregon on a farm that uh, we were not working on, but we were working with the farmer. Um, and that was the same, all the same seed stock and everything that um, we had uh, worked with. So it's all really accurate information numbers. So that, and, that's um, all that generations of farm work, you know, on location before it was even handed mm -hmm. to you or who was it, Red Scare, before you? No, it was um, Real Seed Company. Real Seed Company. You're right, you're right. Um, I'm already feeling it in my arms. My arms feel very, very, that almost that tingly feeling. I can definitely feel yeah. it in my head, like you said, almost like a headband. But it's hitting me more like a one-to-one -one where it's very, very easy and very comfortable. It's not overwhelming at all. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, yeah, man. You beautiful work. Yeah, like, you know, trace, I wouldn't say trace elements, trace amounts, but, you know, one to three percent CBD in there. And it can contain some other, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, can, it, it, has, it might contain some other... Um, cannabinoids? Cannabinoids. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, it might contain some other cannabinoids than um, those two, even. You know, Absolutely. That, That's yeah, actually pretty that. common amongst land races. Yeah, yeah. We ha I mean, when we did the testing, um, when the testing got done, I shouldn't say we, we did the testing. When the testing got done, I think it was 2016, so there's been a whole load of uh, cannabinoids that have been discovered. Then, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, that's pretty amazing, especially when we came from, you know, THC and CBD. And now you've got CBG right. and you've got, you know, even yeah, THCA and CBDA. Was. We're going, what? Oh, that's why you got to heat it up. Got it. <laughs> yeah. And how, how long it was where we were, we didn't even know it. CBD. We didn't know CBD. Yeah. It, that's, a, like... that's a topic that we just need to put a whole episode on. Um, yeah. THCV, awesomeine, all these different things, and you're going, what? There's so many, yeah, and I really like watching your live to, on Instagram, where you guys were just, like, every every episode you guys are going over, like, one different type of terpene or whatever. Oh, yeah, the Terpene so, Tuesday. It's cool to see how much stuff has been coming out, and every time they discover something you want, you know. Thanks, man, I really appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. Yeah. So, before we get too off-subject... I we want to go over like what Sunleaf's doing now. What are you doing with your company now? What's the future of Sunleaf Seed Company? You're I'm seeing you're doing a lot more feminized work. Yeah, yeah. Let's so right now that. we're not we're still going to continue the the land race work and preservation. You now that's never that's never going to stop for us. But we are doing a lot of feminized work and um, with modern cultivars for the main main portion of this this work that we're starting right now so out of these feminized genetics that you're starting to work with what are you putting out there what are you excited about what's in what do people have to expect in the future coming from sun so the main thing that we were you know the main thing with the feminized is that you know people find it really convenient it's kind of where the market's heading but as a breeder um, you can really dial in what's happening, what where your progeny is going with the line, and this is something that you can't you can do with the male when you're when you do rigorous testing. You know, not that we're not doing testing, but when you can really see what the phenotype and the geno, you know, assume the genotype of the female, um, you don't have to deal with something that's unknown so you kind of have a little more a uh, guided breeding when we're doing feminine breeding um so look for 2021 and 2022 we're going to be doing pretty much only working with all feminine breeding techniques um all feminized lines to really uh give people uh more options for feminized seed, but also to try and win more people over towards the feminized seed, because there's this huge misconception that feminized seed is um, unstable. Uh, I was no going to ask you about that. Seed. Um, you know, if you're doing, if you're making it correctly, if we're, you know, it, 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 it's usually not unstable. I haven't had any 
haven't had too many problems. Um, and even some of the feminized teams that I've been running from other breeders that have just started making it recently um, has been really great. So the techniques have really uh, come a long way from what we were using even two years ago. So, uh, you know, the idea is to really get people on board with feminized because this is where the market's going. And not that we're going to stop making regulars, but when you can eliminate uh, variables, you know, when, when you want to directly uh, stabilize the line or make something that uh, isn't going to have a bunch of diversity or variation um, without doing years and years of inbreeding and work, um, you know, feminize is just the way to go. There's absolutely a place for feminized seeds. And, you know, my first argument would be these states that have plant count limits and people don't want to get in any trouble. Sure. It's nice to yeah. know that they're going to have what they want coming out of that seed, yeah. or at least as long as it's from a reputable breeder, you know, um, totally. not only that, if you have no interest in breeding at all, um, feminized might just be for you, you know? Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, you know, some people don't think about other people being limited on space. You know, even me, sometimes I take the, the idea that, someone might be limited on space for granted. That's so true. being able to pop three seeds and know that they're going to get three females is, is much better for them than popping six seeds and they don't know if they're going to get three females. They don't know if they're going to get two. And they don't know if they're going to get six. So, they don't know if they're going to get 12. I've been there. Yeah, and, that's, <laughs> yeah, and I have too where you, you, know, you over pop thinking that you're going to get males and then you get all females and you go, oh no. That's I a, have to get rid of them. And that's I don't an want awesome to. problem. It is. It I can't is. say I've ever it's had that. problem nonetheless. So the idea is to be able you to... You need to go to Vegas and gamble right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the idea is to be able to get people more accustomed to be comfortable growing the feminine seeds. There, there really isn't... If you do all the research, you'll find that it's the breeding is basically the same. We're just making female seeds instead of putting other variables. So So you, you a know, lot of people argue people that it's unnatural, you know, you're just countering nature. Yeah. And how sure. can you I mean, create a good product from something that's so unnatural to a plant? I would I would really disagree. Um, we are using a chemical to change the hormonal production of the plant. Um, but the actual physical, you know, pollinating, it's still natural, and the seed production is natural, and the chromosomes are all natural. It's just female. Yep. You know, so I, I encourage people to do more research on it, uh, and I think you'll find, you know, when we're talking about humans, yeah, it's a much different thing, you know, but when we're talking about plants, they're much different. and It's actually kind of extremely common normal. in nature. Well, and this kind of breeding is extremely common in the agriculture industry. And that's one thing Absolutely. that the cannabis industry has not caught up on. Yep. So to add to that, I would say that I've grown quite a few fem seeds, and I've never had a problem with any of them. Um, yeah. Thankfully, yeah. hopefully it was good work. Maybe I got lucky. Knock on some but yeah, <laughs> but I've had not only good results with fems, I've never had an intersex fem seed. And I have had some really, really good yielders. I had one that was an amnesia haste fem. And I believe that was even from Barney's Farm. And it did excellent. It was like an eight ounce plant, you know, in a in a square meter. No problem. Yeah. And, you know, this is one of the things that we're doing and you can do with Semini Seed is we can really dial in a uh, place that we want to lock in uh, it's just easier to do because we can see the female and we can see what this female will put into a line with this other female. You know, we reverse one on the other. And yeah, it, it, it has variables between, you know, strains that you talk it to, but um, it's much more reliable than uh, to be able to, you know, see what you're doing, what you're working with, than using a male and guessing, you know. And yeah, there's um, testing that you can do now. There's a lot of different kinds of testing that we can get done. But when you're talking about um, the males, you know, uh, these guys growing 100 males and growing off selection, um, 
you still have variables that you can't see in those males that when you when you make your um, uh, crosses, uh, these variables can come out, you know, um, and this is just something that we were trying to eliminate. We're trying to stay on par with the rest of the agriculture uh, industry, you know. Um, if you've done any research, you'll see that there's companies already doing uh, tetraploid and triploid breeding. Yeah, I've heard about that. Create sterile plants, that, you know. So this is where we're going, and we're on a we're trying to be on the coattails. Keep up with these. Yep, make your name in the industry and keep it there. Yeah, and you know, also. You know, I'm not necessarily a scientist. You know, uh, my old partner, he was a doctorate in horticulture, um, major in soil science. Uh, he taught me a lot. He's the one who taught me all the agriculture work. Um, he, uh, so I'm trying to also be a, like a bridge. You know, like I'm just a regular guy, a grower, you know, who's really into this stuff. Uh, and I, I, I try and put stuff into terms that I can understand. You know, sometimes I have to go double read a definition of stuff just to <laughs> read it three or four times to understand it, you know, but digest it and put it into terms that I can explain to other people, um, you know, or, you know, and sometimes that takes a while, but, um, you know, that's, that's where I feel like I personally fit into the industry um, along with my company is like being the bridgeway. Like I want to do the really scientific stuff and keep up with these guys, but also be able to supply to um, the common people and not, you know, big ad farms and stuff like that. Right. We appreciate you for that, brother. Before we get going, brother, um, would you like to get a couple teasers out there as far as some of these fem lines that are to be expected this year? Yeah. Keep an eye out for a platinum... SSV drop that we're going to do. I've uh, got a bunch of really great hybrids that we're going to really put that on Solo Burger. Um, our pink coffee. I've got reg and a few fems that might drop. But what, what it's worth what kind of coffee we did. And you can look back uh, and, and don't worry, I'll be releasing about it, but I don't have a lot of seed of it, so we're going to do some more work with it. But look for me pop up in Oregon. Uh, pop up in Oklahoma, you know, it's typically pop up in Colorado, you know, that's where we're at, but um, really uh, taking a couple of footholds in a couple other states, 2021, 2022, and keeping up our normal work, you know, so watch out and um, try and grab some of our seeds, give us a try. Absolutely. Go get yourself some Sunleaf Seed Company seeds. I can personally vouch for them. They're absolutely amazing. I, could, I couldn't be happier that not only did I grow a land race preservation from you, but they were so stable. You did an amazing job yeah, on them. Yeah, and we've got something for everybody. You know, we got the land race, we got the pure land race, we got the land race hybrids, poly hybrids, and now we're dropping all the fems. So, you know, hit me up in the email. Don't be afraid to ask any questions. I love talking to Charlie. And where can people find you at? Um, check us out on Instagram, Sunleaf Feed. Check it out on, I'm on Facebook, Sunleaf Seed on Facebook. And then uh, you can always email me, sunleafseedco at gmail.com. We're also dropping a website. Uh, I've been saying that for a while, but eventually going to get done at some point this year. It's a lot of work. A lot of work, man. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on the show. We appreciate you sharing your story and telling us what yeah, Sunleaf is all about. Really Absolutely. Always a pleasure talking to you, my brother. I love you. Appreciate you. Much respect, and we will talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Doc. That was an amazing episode. Really love talking to Sunleaf Seed Company. Every time we have a conversation, it's never, never a bad one. He always drops mad information. He's got some amazing stuff that he's working on, and hopefully we'll have him again sometime on the podcast to talk more about what he's working with because he he didn't even touch base on the expanse of some of the types that he works with it's really really quite amazing i encourage you to go out check him out on facebook check him out on instagram go hit him up on his email i guarantee you're gonna find something that you would like to work before we get going i want to give a huge shout out 
to Biohermonic Tonic. You guys can find them on Instagram. You can find them at biohermonictot.com, and you can pick yourself up some. Use code CALYX at checkout. Of course, that's always C-A-L-Y-X at checkout for 10% off your order. We appreciate y'all joining us. Go find us on Patreon. Don't hesitate. We have amazing giveaways every single week. We have games like Do or Dab with Husky Gardens, the game day giveaway with Grow Green Daddy. We've got the Strain Review Sunday with Mrs. Calix. It's a beautiful, wonderful time. We're going to have Mapping Cannabis coming back with Country Green Thumb hopefully soon. And we will also be doing the Terpene Tuesdays again. Everybody's excited about the Terpene Tuesdays. Sunleaf just shouted it out, which I can't appreciate enough. I always love you guys reaching out to me. You can find me on Facebook at Doc Calix. You can find me on Facebook. Um, but IG really is the main platform aside from Patreon. Uh, I encourage you to join the Patreon. It's only $10 a month and it's all exclusive. You also get access to our Discord, 24-7 access to our Discord with, with experienced growers in both organic KNF, no-till, top dress, and synthetic amazing amazing work i love my team of guys over there we're doing great work putting out great content and until next time we'll catch you later <laughs>